straightened out back here and ready to go when the captain's ready. Once that net is down on the bottom, it's going to stay down for 15, maybe 20 minutes for that first crawl. So until it comes back up with animals in it to put out here on the table and into our tub of water up there, I'm going to share with you a little bit about commercial shrimping here in Georgia. Kind of where and when commercial shrimping takes place. Like that, so it'll stick into the sand and lock you in place. You remember those uh, weights I was throwing? They'll drop out here onto our floating thing. The net we're using today is 20 feet wide at the mouth. That is the largest size net that we can pull inside of the estuary. All the rivers and creeks that we're traveling in this afternoon, everything behind the barrier I intended for education here on the Lady Jane. Occasionally, we do get requests from other institutions also looking for animals for either scientific or educational opportunities or that we're doing today. So that's going to widen the boat enough to keep all those larger nets lined up. Lower our net into the water. If you'd like to watch that get deployed here. You'll see those big metal doors come by. Once those are submerged underwater, you'll see the cables spread apart as they open up the mouth of the net for us. We're probably in about 25 feet of water here. We're going to lower that all the way down to the bottom. That I want to share with you. These two items, these would be required to be incorporated into your net anytime you are commercially stripping. Oh, they're waiting for, for the birds are waiting for their death. Now they're waiting for their death. Oh, there's a crab. 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 Oh, there's a crab.
right, so this is our Atlantic Stingray. Oh, this is the Atlantic Stingray. He's the smaller of our stingrays. We have three different types of stingrays here on the Georgia coast. Uh, they get about two feet from wingtip to wingtip when they're fully grown. This little one here is a southern stingray, and they get about four feet from wingtip to wingtip when they're fully grown. So we'll save both of those so we can compare them. This right here is called a butterfly ray, and they get about three feet from wingtip to wingtip to compare those. We've got a couple of these butterfly rays that we're going to put in there. And you're going to get a chance to touch on these and hold on to these. Most of the fish that we have in here are these guys. These guys are called spots. They have this big dark spot right there on their side above their pectoral fin. So that's an easy one to recognize when you see them. We have some shrimp in here. Uh, most of the shrimp that we're catching are brown shrimp. This is a species of shrimp that we harvest. We're known for our Georgia white shrimp. Uh, but these are brown shrimp that we're picking up back here. We might see some white shrimp as well. Maybe when we get closer out towards the barrier islands. This one right here is called a Minhaden. Locally we call those puggies. We have some little baby sea trout in here. This probably our most popular game fish are going to be our sea trout. Those are summer trout right there. Well, that one not really moving over there. One little blue crab in here. We'll throw him in the tub as well. And we have quite a few squid in here. This is the Atlantic breed squid. We'll put a few of those in there as well. Another one. Alright, we're going to start getting rid of the ones that we don't need here. Yes. Right here. This, I'm glad you spotted that. This is a mantis shrimp. Uh, he's a, a stomopod. He's not a true shrimp. He's a crustacean, but he's a stomopod. That's a really neat animal to look at and talk about. Hello, this catfish, sea cat. Oh, wow. Is that, is that a sea cat? Alright, we're going to let the rest of these guys go. And we're going to take a look at our sharks. I'm oh, sorry, our rays. We're going to catch sharks. Our rays here first. Look at what's going on to the right. Let's see what happens. Now we're going to start with yeah. our stingray. Yeah. 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 So listen closely, okay? <laughs> this again is the Atlantic stingray. All of your stingrays are known for their really long tails. And about halfway down their tail is their barb. This is how they get their name Stingray. It's sharp on the tip, it's serrated on the sides, and there is venom in the serrated sides of the barb. They have the barb in that location so they can flex their tail and get that barb up and over their back. They spend a lot of their time buried on the bottom. So when they're attacked by a predator like a shark, usually coming in from the top. They want to get that bar up and over their back to defend themselves. You can see the eyes are right there on top of the head and they have these really big holes right behind the eyes. Those are called spiracles. The spiracles connect to the mouth and the gills which are on the underside of the ray. And I'm going to flip this one over. You can see the mouth and the gills. Here's the mouth right here. These little slits running down are the gill slits that they breathe through. Sharks and rays, they have multiple gill slits where the fish we're going to look at. The fish we're going to look at, they'll have one gill opening on each side of the head. And when we look at the fish, we'll open the gills up. We'll take a closer look at gills, talk about how they breathe. But imagine this ray laying down on the bottom of a muddy creek, buried in the mud 
trying to take water in its mouth and out through the gills, it would likely get a mouthful of mud. So instead, it's going to take water in through the holes on top, the spiracles, and then out through the gills on the underside there to breathe. Now, I'm going to help you with the stingray by holding on to the tail for you the whole time so you don't have to worry about the barb there. You can touch this one anywhere on top. It does have some little barbs here on its back. They're not very sharp. They're not venomous. You can gently feel the ones here on the back. And if you want to hold on to it, just put your hands side by side like that and I'll lay it in your hands. Before we do that, we're going to compare this one to our butterfly ray. The butterfly rays you can hold on to on your own. So we're going to be passing the butterfly rays around while I help you with the stingray there. So we are looking at the butterfly ray. You might notice right off it has a very short tail compared to the stingray. And it has no barb back here on his tail, so he's safe for you to hold on to. His main defense is going to be his camouflage. You can see he has his pretty speckled skin. He's going to lay on the bottom, so bury himself on the bottom, and try to go completely unnoticed by predators. Just like the stingray, the eyes are on top, big holes behind the eyes, mouth, and the gills tickle, here on tickle, the underside. Tickle. I'm going to take one. Now, I have two of these. You can put two hands underneath them, just like this, if you want to hold on to them, pass them around. You want to start? There you go. Right, they are really slimy. All that slime helps the mud and the sand come off of them when they're buried on the bottom. So Y'all can pass it that I could direction. touch that fish if I wanted to, but I can't. And we'll start one over here. You ready for this one? Two hands underneath it. <laughs> They'll calm down in a moment once he realizes he's not swimming. Very good. Now I'll go grab our stingray while those are going around. So to hold on to the stingray, just put both your hands out side by side. There you go. Both. It's just a little piece of that fish. The stingray that we have here, this little Atlantic ray, is born live. Water ray is born live. The Atlantic stingray has the barbs on its tail when it's born. It's immediately on its own, meaning to hunt for itself and defend itself when it's born. It's like a mushroom. You can slide them back in there, yeah. Those are the ones we catch. You want to pass them over? There you go. Slide it back to me. You, want to, you can give it a pet on top if you don't want to hold it. You can touch it as well. This one is about the size they are when they're born. This one's probably just a few weeks old at this size. Our Atlantic stingray here, they're a little smaller when they're born. This was probably a few months old at that size. But you can kind of see the difference in the two rays there. The southern. I think we put both of them in the same day this year. And the Atlantic. But it still has the bar down there on the tail. That one might be good. Right. You want to let this one go for me? No. Did it? Alright, come down to this little short wheel beside me here. Let's take a look at some of our other fish here. We're going to start with the one that we caught the most of. Anybody remember his name? Spot. That's right, Spot. He's got that big spot there on the side. If we didn't know anything else about him, we could learn a lot about him by looking at different parts of his body. For example, we open up his mouth, you can see it points down to the bottom. So you know he's picking food up off the bottom, he's not chasing after anything. And he doesn't really have many teeth inside of his mouth. You can feel around in there when we pass him around. Since he doesn't have a lot of teeth, he's picking up soft things like worms, plant and animal matter. 
all the organic stuff down on the bottom. <laughs> Even taking big mouthfuls of sand and mud and sifting it around his mouth, cleaning up the estuary floor for us of all the organic matter that settles down there. So he is our bottom feeding scavenger. Now if you look at his tail, he has a big wide tail. That tells you he's a relatively slow swimmer. The more forked the fish's tail is, like our menhaden here on top, the faster of a swimmer they are. So when you see that forked tail, you know that fish is designed to swim fast through the water, most all the time, where a wide tail is going to be moving slow most of the time, unless something's chasing it. It can swim fast, it just has to put its whole body into it, so it'll likely wear itself out pretty quick. Now we're going to pass these around, I have a couple of these. And that one, put two hands on them, hold them up near the head, close to the head, near those spots actually. Holding on right there at those spots is really good. And you can, remember, put your fingers in his mouth if you want to. Are you ready for that one? There you go. So usually our little baby black tips have a little more black on their fins. 
But it could be. When they're little juveniles, it's really hard to identify a lot of your shark species that look really similar. Uh, I'm going to guess because of his length and slenderness that so this is a little little baby Atlantic shark nose shark. And you're going to get a chance to hold on to him. Uh, we're going to pass him around. What's up, Sharky? Hold on to him. What's up, Sharky? Uh, we've got another stingray there. We have a flounder. This is our flat fish. He lays flat on the bottom, just like he's laying in my hand right there. He has a big mouth with sharp teeth. 
waiting for something to come nearby, like a fish or a shrimp. You can swoop up off the bottom, swallow a bowl, and then go back down to hiding out on the bottom. All right, you can put two hands underneath the flounder. Make sure one hand is underneath the head to support the head. If the head's hanging off, he's going to probably slide out of your hands. Good job. We have a couple more fish we're going to look at here while the flounder is going around and then we'll get into our invertebrates, our squid and our shrimp. We talked about the menhaden having this uh, forked tail here, fast swimming fish. Our harvest fish also has that forked tail, another fast swimmer. The harvest fish here has a little tiny mouth, it's kind of mushed up against his face. And it's not good for a lot, but it's really good at taking little nibbles of jellyfish. So you're going to find the pools of harvest fish following around jellyfish, taking little nibbles of them. Now they don't have to be a fast swimming fish. You can pass them around. They don't have to be a fast swimming fish to catch jellyfish. So their speed is their defense. To get away from predators, swim away really fast and then come back around to their jellyfish. Yeah, the flounder, they'll, they'll usually stay on their side like that when they swim. Uh, did you make, yeah, you made it all the way around? Yeah, you can. You want to let her do it? All right, we talked about our menhaden earlier. This is a different menhaden that I'm holding up right here. Uh, I want to show you something inside of this one's mouth. You look inside there, there's something on the roof of his mouth looking back at you. You'll see something gray with two little black eyes peeking out. These are common, these are parasites that are common inside of Menhaden. Our first one didn't have one, but this one does. This is called a tongue-eating isopod. And as that descriptive name says, this isopod is going to eat this fish's tongue. And in order to make room for itself to live in the fish's mouth. And then it's going to hold on to the muscle where the tongue was attached and the fish can then move the parasite around its mouth as if it was the original tongue. So this is the only example of this that we've ever seen in nature where one animal is going to remove part of another animal and then function as that part of the animal for the rest of its life. Now we're going to pass a little parasite around if you want to hold on to it. Take note of the yellow on the abdomen here. Those are her eggs in there. You can kind of see them developing in her abdomen. You can throw that one over. Now, she does have little hooks on her hands, so she might hook onto your skin. Uh, she won't bite you, but if she does hook on, you just kind of peel her off of your skin. Or you can let her lay on her back, just like that. You don't want to pass the parasite around? <laughs> That fish gets about this big when he's fully grown. So that parasite gets nearly the size of a pinky when it's fully grown. So that's really interesting in and of itself, but it gets even more interesting uh, when you look at the life cycle of that parasite. The one we're passing around there is a female. And she has eggs right now. And when those eggs are a little more than a female in there, one of those little tiny males will go forward, eat the tongue, get really big, and turn into a we'll female. All the other ones, uh, they'll remain the size they were when they were born. They'll never get any bigger if they stay males. So this one probably has half a dozen males living in the gills as well as the big female there. I was going to throw them to the bird right there. Let's bird at that's probably a mistake to do that. Now they're all going to land on that. <laughs> Ew, a bird pooped on it. It's a fresh bird poop. Oh, you can see him eating it. He's almost done We're eating it. We're going to throw the parasite over. Something will eat it. Something will eat it. Or probably where it's the bottom. You want to catapult it off the back? 
Parasite. Have parasites. Trap walkers are. Have parasites. I haven't seen any parasites on a mantis ship before. That one can go over when you're ready. So our little guy here, uh, this is a mantis shrimp. Uh, he's a stomopod. You can find stomopods all around the world. Uh, this is our local variety. He gets about eight inches when he's fully grown. He gets the name mantis shrimp because he does look kind of shrimp-like. But his front paws up here, they fold out like a praying mantis insect, like you might find in your backyard, in the garden. So he has these really neat claws up front for grabbing onto fish. He's a predator. He's got these little green eyes up here. He's going to live down in a little burrow. And when something swims over the top, he's going to reach out with these spiny claws and grab them, pull them down into his burrow there. Now, what's, yeah. I've, uh, sorry. I've heard that mantis shrimp have like a club kind of. That yeah. Shoot out. Well, I've heard that one is a club, and what's the other one again? So there's two different types of mantis yeah. shrimp. Uh, some are clubbing, yeah. and these are got these little spines. Oh, okay, those spines. So when you see the spines, they're more eating fleshy things like other shrimp and fish. Yeah. If the clubbing type, they're more eating like crabs and snails okay. that they're gonna punch yeah. with those big cl clubs to get through their shells. Yeah. So based on what the claws look like, will tell you which kind you have and what they're feeding on. Okay. Now, what's really amazing about this animal is check out these little green eyes up there. This is actually, this animal has the best vision of any animal on the entire planet. Yep. He can see more colors and that we can't see. He can see colors that we can't even imagine. And he can see multiple spectrums of light that we cannot perceive as well. So to us, he doesn't look very colorful. He looks kind of drab. But to another mantis shrimp, this guy is just exploding with bright, vibrant colors that we can't see. Now, we're going to pass him around. You want to pinch him kind of right here on the back like this. Um, he does have really sharp spines on his tail. If he gets kind of cantankerous and he comes around with those spines and tries to poke you, just drop them because they're sharp. Um, don't try to hold on to them. But he looks like he's pretty chill, so I don't think he's going to try to poke anybody. All right, you want to pass him around? Pinch him right there on the back. If he gets a little upset with you, don't in a really testy mood. Uh, he can pop his claws forward fast enough to cut your skin. So if you're a commercial shrimper, and you've got a pile of shrimp sitting on the table there, and you're reaching in, grabbing their shrimp, and you come across a really big mantis shrimp, and he's in a really bad mood, he can easily cut your skin with those claws. That's a good idea. Why not? Wear gloves. All right, let's see. We've got our blue crab left in here, but I think we're going to be pulling up our final net here soon. Yeah, it's staying right there. Uh, we'll talk about our blue crab. We might not get through him. We'll get him back out. But we'll start talking about him until that next net comes up. So you can see the really pretty blue colors underneath here, giving our blue crab his name. This is the same blue crab you're going to find all up and down the East Coast, around in the Gulf of Mexico as well. Most crabs are crawling on the bottom, walking along the bottom. Blue crabs are swimming crabs. The back pair of legs I'm holding on to, they're flattened out. Did you have to throw him over? Did you have to? Yeah, let him throw it over. Uh, you can see the back pair of legs I'm holding on to. They're flattened out like little paddles. Those are their swimming legs. They can rotate these in little circles over their back to swim through the water. And they swim sideways through the water very well. I'm going to hold on to the claws here. I'm going to let you not have to worry about those for a moment. You can feel the hard shell, the protective shell. We catch this every single day, no matter what. Uh, remind me when we're done and we'll let you know about it. Uh, he has this really hard shell, gives him a lot of protection, but the shell does not grow with him. In order for him to get any bigger, he actually has to come out of his shell. So he does that in a process called molting. What that looks like for a blue crab is his shell is going to split open in between those swimming legs. He's going to climb out of the shell, leaving the entire shell intact and hollow. And when he comes out, he's going to have a soft skin. 
That's how you get a soft shell crab if you like to eat those or see that on the menu. That's a blue crab that is just bolted out of the shell. When he's soft, he has about 24 hours before that soft skin is going to re-harden into a new shell. He's really vulnerable. He goes hide somewhere, swells his body up, gets a little bit bigger, and lets that skin re-harden. You want to touch him? During that molting process, he can regrow legs, he can regrow claws that are missing, and they're going to do that about nine times a year here on the Georgia coast. Now, the way we're going to hold on to them, if you want to hold on to them, I want you to use your thumb and your forefinger, just like you've seen me do, to pinch on the sides of these little swimming legs back there. With one hand, just grab them like that. Uh, I'll hold the claws, and I'll let you get a grip before I let go. Who wants to hold on to them? Right here, one hand, thumb and forefinger, a little pinch right there. Perfect. When you're done with them, hand them back to me, and I'll pass them along to the next person. You done with them? Alright. Hold on to them. I cooperate. Bye. 
okay? Underneath their tail, the front.